Please take your Bibles and go to James chapter 5, if you would, please. James chapter 5. This is the closing message to our series through the book of James. Of course, the theme for this series has been Living for Jesus. Uh, this book is real practical in its application to the Christian life, of course. As we look at James chapter 5, we've already seen how that uh, living for Jesus takes active living, active against materialism in the first six verses of Scripture of this chapter, and then active in enduring through trials, verses 7 to 12, and then active in pursuing personal holiness, verses 13 to 18, and then today, active in helping others from verses 19 and 20. James chapter 5, verse 19 says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. When... I was in Bible college. I had the privilege of going to two Bible colleges. I also had the privilege of cramming four years of education into five. And so I can remember though one time the president of the Bible college got up and he said these words. He says, if you ever reach a point in your education where you receive demerits that will cause you to be expelled from college, we will need to expel you but at the same time, as pastor of the church, I will be at the front of the driveway with my arms wide open and help get you back on track. And, you know, as I think about that through the years, I think how important it is not only to heed the disciplinary aspect of the Word of God, but also have that way back for the sinner to be reinstated in the fellowship of God and the fellowship of God's people. Dr. Lester Roloff, a man of the past, uh, was uh, really instrumental in establishing some homes in Corpus Christi, Texas, that really sought to help men and women get back on track who had been ravaged and enslaved by sin. Some went to the homes there in Texas, and they were not saved, but many had made a profession of faith, and yet they'd become entangled again in the yoke of bondage and needed help getting their lives back on track. And Dr. Lester Roloff gave his life uh, for that purpose, to try to uh, really rebuild some men and women and get them serving the Lord Jesus Christ again. It's interesting that James closes these five chapters with these two verses of Scripture. I mean, it's amazing to me that of all the things that could be said, you would think that he would have more of a closing statement in this book. And yet, once again, staying with the theme of really the practicality of the Word of God and helping people in their faith, he closes with these two verses of Scripture. James started writing this book to believers and sought to encourage those going through trials. Go back to chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. He says, my brethren, some people would like to think that verses 19 and 20 that we're looking at this morning uh, really has to do with winning the lost. That may be an application, but I believe we stay with the same uh, interpretation that we've been seeing all throughout these five chapters. And I believe that these two verses of scripture deal with really the helping of believers who have been backslidden in their faith. But once again, as you look at uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 2, my brethren, he's writing to believers. He says, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And so I also see that the Bible's filled with accounts of those who at one time had a vibrant walk with God, they backslid, and praise the Lord, many of them were restored back into fellowship with God and to a place of service. And so I thought of David, of course, and I'm, I've got three examples I'm gonna give you from the scriptures, and I pick out the uh, main ones that we may make reference to time and time again, 
simply because we're really wanting to get to the other aspects of the message, but also that we can uh, re refer to on a quick basis in our minds, in our memory. David was a man we know from the scriptures that was king of Israel. He was chosen by God. He was anointed by God to be the king. And yet we find due to laziness, due to a filthy mind, due to adultery, murder, and then the deceit of trying to hide his sin. We find such glaring faults with him and how he backslid. And yet at the same time, we find that after he was confronted by Nathan, that he broke and he asked God to forgive him. And I want to make reference to Psalm chapter 51. Psalm chapter 51, this was right after uh, David was confronted uh, by Nathan. And I'm going to read the first uh, 13 verses of scripture here. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. So we see here where David sinned, and we would say that there are little sins that we can identify in his life, as we would categorize in our humanness as a little sin, or a grave or big sin. We also see the little ones, and we see the big ones, and we also see the forgiveness of Almighty God over all sin, even in the life of a believer. Take your Bibles, if you would, and go to Acts chapter 13. I'm gonna read just one verse of scripture. If you want me just to read it, that's fine. You do, I might be there before you are. In uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 36, here's the testimony hundreds of years later that God has given in regards to the man David. Sometimes because we would recall these sins and we know that the Old Testament, these characters, their faults, as well as their positive traits have been given to us so that we can learn from them in our lifetime. But it's interesting that God gives this testimony of David in Acts chapter 13. If you'll look with me to verse 36. For David after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid into his fathers and saw corruption. So here you find in the book of Acts that was penned by Luke, we find that God gives testimony because he forgave that sin. He took that sin and he cleansed him. First John 1, 9, written to believers, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you take the sin that you've committed, dear believer, as a child of God, and you ask for his forgiveness, that fellowship that had been broken, that wall that had been erected, we find that that wall comes down, that fellowship is restored, and you can have the joy of your salvation once again. That's the glorious truth of being in right standing with our Heavenly Father. I mean, once a son, always a son. Amen? And so we find that time and time again, we find that the Bible is filled with those Bible characters that had a vibrant walk with God, 
They backslid, but yet they got right with God and found a place of service. Maybe not always to the same extent that they had before, but God forgives, he sends those sins away, and of course, then we can be used as a chosen vessel unto him once again. We think of the life of Peter. Peter, we know that that one who denied the Lord three times, he went out and wept bitterly. You can just imagine how he must have felt after he had already come out and said, there's no way that I would ever deny you, Jesus, and there's no way that I'm gonna let anyone do you harm. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God. In other words, uh, in that moment of physical uh, weakness and the humanness of, of his heart, yes, the integrity of his mind, he says, I will always stand true to God. We find him trying to hinder the Lord Jesus from going to the cross. And so Jesus gave him that verbal rebuke. Peter was already a saved man at that point. And then we find him being a saved man. We find him then denying the Lord three times. He said, no, I don't know the man. No, I don't know the man. Then he cursed and he swore. If you and I had been in that crowd, we'd say that there's no way that that man could be saved. And yet he was a saved man. And as soon as Jesus Christ heard that last denial, he turned and looked at Peter. Their eyes locked in. Peter dropped his head. He went out, wept bitterly. John chapter 20, you find him going out and he says, I'm going fishing. He says, I'm going back to the old life. I'm going back to that which I was doing before God called me to preach. And so he backslid. And yet we find that he gets his heart right. And then in Acts chapter two, before some crowd of people, he preaches Jesus Christ and 3,000 precious souls come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here was a man that had a vibrant walk with God. He backslid and then he got right with God and found a place once again of useful service. In fact, God used him to open up the gospel to the then known world, to the Jew in Acts chapter two, to the Samaritan in Acts chapter eight, and then to the Gentile in Acts chapter 10. Hallelujah, that the gospel was opened up to us, to you, and to me, amen? We find John Mark on the first missionary journey. We find that Paul and Barnabas set out in Acts chapter 13, but they never traveled alone. They had other men that went along with them. And so we find though that once they encountered after the glorious send off service, they encountered uh, the devil. They, can, uh, they encountered someone who had been uh, demonized and we find that uh, there was that shock, I believe, of that oppression that they felt. And then with the persecution that came, John Mark said, you know what? I don't think I can handle this. And so he cut out and run. He left them high and dry. And we find that even after that first missionary journey, there came a time in the end of that first journey when they were gonna go and start that second journey. Barnabas said, hey, let's take John Mark with us. Paul said, no way, no way. I'm not gonna take that quitter. I'm not gonna, uh, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna give him that second chance. He left us high and dry and we have to have someone who's faithful. Well, the proverb says that confidence in an unfaithful man is as a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. He said, the last thing we need to do is be counting on a man in the work of God and have them wash out once again. There's no way we're taking him. And there they split at that time. Some 10 years transpire from that event. We find at the conclusion of 2 Timothy in chapter four, uh, the, the life of Paul is drawing to a close, but he says, you know, I want you to give me the books, bring me the books and bring me the parchments, referring to the word of God. But he also says, send John Mark, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So here was a young man. Oh, he hit a blip in the screen, so to speak. He, 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 he quit for just a period of time, but then he got back his feet, spiritual feet under him, and then we find him in a place of service once again for the cause of Christ. 
And I want us to take our Bibles and go now to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, we have the account of the prodigal son. Notice the account of the prodigal son. And as we read this account, I want you to see that the father is a picture of God. I want you to see that the prodigal is the wayward son. And I want you to see that the elder brother is also the self-righteous son. And we need to understand that we are pictured in this particular passage of scripture. There are several applications that people make in Luke chapter 15. Some of them believe that this is a passage that talks about uh, one who is unsaved and comes to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that might be an application, but I see here that there was a son in fellowship with his father. Then I see a son who went out, out and backslid and went into the ways of the world, but I also see that son getting right with his father. I also see that elder brother who thinks he's better than that wayward son. And he's holier than thou, he's self-righteous, and he begins to list all his good qualities and the faults of his, his brother. And so he's just put out that more attention would be given to the wayward son that had come back into fellowship than they would give him. And so we find as we read this account in Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. Let me just say, when you ever backslide and you try to go your own way, if you're a true child of God, you're gonna hit a famine. And it says here, there's a famine in that land and he began to be in want. That means he began to be in need. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. You'll become a slave to the people of the world and you'll become a slave to the habits of the world. And it says here that he had to feed the swine and for a Jewish boy that looked at the pig as an unclean animal this was an insult upon all insults. And it says here, and he would fain have filled his belly with a hus that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. And when he had come to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. There you find that, that humbleness, that when you realize that you are uh, out of fellowship with God, and you have sin that's come into your life, you come to yourself and you realize, I am in need to be reinstated into fellowship with my heavenly Father. And when you come in that humbleness, and you realize that you are a sinner in need of help at this time. Then he says, you know what, whatever you want to do, uh, that's okay. Whatever I have to do, that's okay. Whatever punishment I have to go through, that's okay. Because whatever is due me is due me. I just want to be back in fellowship with you, Father. And so he goes back to his heavenly Father. And he arose and came to his Father, verse 20. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He was right there all the time waiting, 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 looking, looking for that son to come back. God's love is ever constant. God's love is ever true. And our love as believers in Jesus Christ, one with another ought to be the same. He says, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Now, verse 25, now his elder son was in the field 
And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never, never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Praise the Lord for the prodigal son coming to himself, getting right with the heavenly father. We don't have the account here of what happened to the elder son in his spirit, in his heart. But it's obvious that he was not right with God in his heart in regards to the relationship that he should have had with his father and his brother. And so let's go back now to our text passage of scripture. Now this is all uh, people getting right with God themselves, where they had that vibrant walk. David had that vibrant walk. Peter had that vibrant walk. We find John Mark did, and then they backslid, but then they got right with God. But let's look at verse 19 and 20 of our text. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Notice once again in verse 19, the word brethren. James is writing to believers. And so this is an opportunity for us to be like Jesus. And he's given out some closing uh, statements here in regards to what our ministry as believers ought to be in this fallen world and even in light of our brothers and sisters in Christ who may have wandered from the fold. Brethren, he says, this is a ministry for you. We've talked about now to this point in the message by way of introduction, those who had wandered from the fold and be reinstated, but how are we supposed to go about helping that fallen brother? How are we supposed to be involved in this ministry of restoration? And it's amazing how sometimes, uh, I'm not saying that we do away with the church discipline aspect of things. That's clearly taught in the scriptures as we'll see in just a moment. But there also ought to always be that time where we have our hands and our arms outstretched saying, oh, we want you back into fellowship. We need to admonish them as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we ought to seek the restoration of the wayward ones. We see here, as we continue to read, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him. He is addressing, James is a general audience and is essentially saying that if any one of the crowd of believers backslides and one helps to restore him, he can know some certain things. This is, this is so important here in the life of the believer. And I find it interesting that James warns us about the trials and testings and temptations that we will face as Christians. He also lets us know the things that we need to be aware of as we looked at materialism in chapter uh, uh, five here, the first six verses of scripture, he warns us about these things. And now he says, we ought to be involved in a ministry of restoration. And really that's the, uh, I know that that's one of the jobs I have as a pastor, but it's also a privilege that's given to each and every one of us as blood-bought saints. All of us need others to draw up alongside of us and help us from time to time. Let's look at some things here. Look, I want us to see, first of all, that this, these two verses are part of the prayer passage mentioned in this particular chapter, right on the heels of these verses. Let's begin reading here in verse 13. The Bible says, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? 
Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And notice right after that, you have the closing two verses of scripture. He begins with the word brethren once again. And so we see here that first and foremost, when we know of a brother or sister in Christ that's away from him, when he has backslidden, she has walked away from the things that the Bible teaches, then we ought to be praying for them earnestly. One of the things that concerns me sometimes about the Wednesday night prayer sheet is we have people mentioned there and we have some general people mentioned in, in our prayer sheet as well. And if we're not careful, because they're listed week after week after week after week, we just sort of gloss over them. We don't really pay much attention and our hearts ought to break for those who are once a part of us who've wandered from the fold, who are out there in the ways of the world, entangled again in the yoke of bondage, you know that one day the famine's gonna come and we ought to seek the very best for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We ought to be part of those who restore the fallen and we find that we ought to be available to them so that when they reach the end of themselves and repent of their sin, that we'll be right there. And even that, we can go and draw up alongside of them in the midst of their trouble and say, brother, sister, I love you, I care for you. Please turn your life around. Please turn the boat around. We don't wanna see you go through the troubles of life. We don't wanna see you have that chastising hand of God come upon you. And we find, if you'll take your Bibles and go to Galatians chapter two, Galatians chapter two, and this is a very telling uh, passage of scripture as well, a ministry for us in Galatians. We find these words in verse one. Notice, brethren. So here's an admonition to us of the church. Sometimes it seems like when someone goes on to sin, we just sort of wash our hands and say, good riddance. Uh, we'll just let them hit the brick wall. Folks, uh, I don't want to hit the brick wall if I'm out of fellowship. I want somebody to draw up alongside me and help me. Don't you want somebody to help you if they, you find yourself in that same situation? That's what the scripture says. Look what it says here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, that means overwhelmed. It says here, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. In other words, we ought to have the same care and compassion for others who have been overwhelmed with sin in their life as we would want people to be compassionate and caring for us if we ever come to that point where we are overwhelmed with sin in our lives. And he says, it's in the spirit of weakness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. It's a spiritual work. It's not for the, the uh, carnal believer. Carnal believers act carnally. They act like babes. They pitch their fits. They take their stands. And yet here, spiritual people are those who are brokenhearted when those wander from the fold of God. And he says here, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What burden are you carrying for the wayward today? What burden, what, what prayers are being uttered on behalf of those who are away from the Lord Jesus Christ in fellowship? Look at verse seven of our same text passage of scripture, Galatians chapter six. He says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Yes, those who go and sin, there's always a punishment for sin. There's always a price to pay for sin. We never get away from the penalty of sin. And I'm talking about even in the life of the believer here. No, a believer does not have to fear hell. 
but yet we're seeing the aspect of reward. We're seeing the aspect of fellowship with God. And we see here where he says, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Look at verse 10, if you would, please. The Bible says, and as we have, therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. We ought to be concerned about our brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we're not careful, we'll become so judgmental and we'll become so critical of those who don't line up exactly like we do. And what we ought to do is we ought to be concerned for them. We ought to first and foremost drop to our knees, if not physically, at least spiritually, and pray for them and ask God to intervene in their life. And then we ought to say, Lord, is there something that I can do? Is there something I can say? Can I go to them and make a difference? You say, but you know, we'll just leave that up to the pastor. We don't find any qualifiers like that. This is the job of every single believer in the family. If you are a brother or sister and you have a brother or sister that's not doing right, not living for God, you ought to have concern. If you have other brothers and sisters that are serving God, then what would happen if one brother would go and another brother would go and another brother would go and a sister would go and a sister would go? I mean, time and time again, it's not just one of us, it's all of us. What would happen if 600 people in this room would drop to their spiritual needs and pray for those who are out of fellowship with God today? I'm not talking about those who have an ax to grind and gone somewhere else. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those who are out of fellowship. They're in the world, they're into sin, and yet we can make a big difference in their life. As we pray together, can you imagine if 600 plus people would begin to pray for those out of fellowship. Pray for them by name. Many of you know those who are out into the world eating those, those husks of corn that's not gonna bring any lasting satisfaction because only Jesus does that. Can you imagine if we would all draw up alongside the throne of grace and beseech God to act in regards to that, sending someone to tell that one to get right with him and to see that soul restored to fellowship once again. How needed this is. Take your Bibles, if you would, and go to 1 Corinthians chapter five. We're so good at being able to pass judgment and say, yeah, this, you ought to do this, and you ought to drop the hammer here, and you ought to do that, and so on. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Here we have an account of the church acting righteously. 1 Corinthians chapter five. We have here that church discipline had to be enacted because at this particular point in time, this, this believer in the church was acting like an unsaved individual. And the church only qualifies for membership if you know Jesus Christ as your personal savior. You've been baptized as an outward profession of your inward condition of your heart. You've united in fellowship with that local assembly and yet you, that was a qualifier for the local church. And then we find here that this, this gentleman had said, you know what, I'm a part of the church, but I'm choosing to live in immorality. And so the church had to say, no, 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 no. You can't live like the lost and be a part of our church because the, the church is for saved people. The church is for people who have uh, Jesus Christ as their savior. And if you're going to deny the change of life that he expects from the believer, then you don't belong here. And so he says this in chapter five, verse one, for we know that if our earthly house of this, no, I'm not second Corinthians, sorry, first Corinthians chapter five. <laughs> first Corinthians chapter five, it says these words, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. This is sexual sin. He says, and such fornication and is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. This is more debauchery that he was involved in that even the world looked down upon. And he says, and ye are puffed up. This church was so open-minded saying, oh, you know, isn't it great that we just love everyone and 
Well, we take people as they are. I want anybody and everybody to come to Pimena Valley Baptist Church. They can come any way they want to, but I want them to leave differently. I want to leave differently. It says here, and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. So, you know, a lot of people go to Matthew chapter seven and says, judge not lest you be judged. I may not be able to judge somebody's motive, but I can judge their deed as we see here. And if the Bible says something sin, it's sin. And that sin is a deed. And it says here in verse four, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together, that's the church getting together, he's speaking to the church of Corinth, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What's he saying? There's protection in the local church. There's protection in right fellowship with God. That's the power of the church. Don't minimize the church. And that's where it says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it talks about the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. He goes on to say, verse 6, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. In other words, the world's gonna do what the world's gonna do. And so we're gonna mix as we do our business, as we go uptown, as we shop. We're gonna be with those who are of the world, that are covetous, that are extortioners, with idolaters. And he says this, he says, but now, he says, but now I have written unto you not to keep company. And that's talking about where you seek out their fellowship where you try to make them comfortable in their sin. You should never allow a sinner to be comfortable in your presence, especially a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ that ought to know better, that ought to serve Christ with their heart, mind, soul, body of strength. And yet we have the tendency, if we're not careful, to say, well, we wanna show them a better way, but what we're doing is we're opening the door for their wicked influence to be in our lives and dumb us down. We ought to be picking them up. And it says here, but now I have written unto you not to keep company, casualness. And if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one know not to eat. And see, eating was that fellowship that people would have. And so he said, look, when he's not saying to avoid people all directly. He's just saying you are to seek to restore them to fellowship as far as getting their hearts right, their sin right in their life, not just to have a good time with them. And there's too much of people trying to have a good time with those in the world and those who are out of fellowship. And what's happening is those that are out of fellowship with God continue to be out of fellowship. And what happens is there's something that takes place in our mind where we think, well, you know what they're doing is not that bad. And so we begin to dumb down the deceitfulness of sin and the wickedness of sin in our own lives. He says, for what have I to do, verse 12, to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. He's talking about the unsaved outside the church. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So someone who is refusing to get right with God, God says they're acting wickedly. They're acting like the unsaved world. And so they don't belong in the fellowship of the believers as we're seeking to walk with God and, and, and learn the truths of God. But notice there's something wonderful about this account. You say, where is that found? It's not found in chapter five of 1 Corinthians. 
but flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And this is a wonderful truth. And we find here was a man who was in immorality. He was, I would like to say, in the bitter dregs of sin. And he had been obstinate, rebellious, not wanting to get right, refusing to get right. And praise the Lord that when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians as a way of rebuke and to straighten out problem after problem after problem in that local church, we find that they heeded that, they got things right. You go to 2 Corinthians chapter two, and I'd like to begin reading here in verse five. The Bible here says, but if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man as this punishment, which was afflict, uh, inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And so just as we take the stand against the one in sin, we need to do everything in our power to help them be restored to fellowship in Jesus Christ. And then when they do get right, then we ought not treat them like they're unclean. They don't have to walk around saying unclean, 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 because when God has given them forgiveness, we need to forgive them as well. And when they're trying to get back into fellowship with God's people, we ought to be putting our arms around them, we ought to give them words of affirmation, and they ought to feel our love for them. Instead of, oh, uh, let's just uh, back off and just see if they really mean business this time. And then they become saddened and more discouraged thinking that, oh, even though God's forgiven me, these people won't forgive me. I'm not welcome here anymore. And we ought to be a welcoming body for those who want to live for Christ. And we see here as we go to our text passage of scripture, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one, convert him. That word, that word convert confuses us. And this is why sometimes I think we give a wrong uh, interpretation of this passage. Convert means to turn about. It means to turn again. It means to bring back. And what we as believers ought to be involved in is we ought to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Already in chapter one, we see the onslaught of the evil one, the temptations we face the trials we go through, the troubles we have, oh my. And when we find a brother or sister that has given in to a temptation, they've fallen in the midst of the troubles and trials, then they need somebody to come alongside and help restore them. I like the way one commentator said, it's like resetting a bone tenderly. They've, they're broken. They need somebody to come alongside and help them. As Ecclesiastes says, two are better than one. For if one falls, there'll be one to reach down and pick them up. And we ought to be that one who reaches down and helps pick up that one who's fallen. I'm not, again, saying that we justify the sin. No one, no wise. But we ought to always have our arms outstretched. And when someone has gone in the ways of the world, and they're trying to get back or they need to get back, somebody ought to go and say, oh, brother, sister, I love you. I care for you. We used to have sweet fellowship together, and I want to have that again. And help them get back into fellowship. And the Bible here goes on to say, converteth him. That means helps turn him around. What a ministry you can have as a body of believers if you know someone who's not walking with God, they've made that sweet profession of faith. They've taken that outward step of obedience to the Lord. They used to sit where you sit. They used to sing the songs that you sing. They used to be in sweet fellowship and oh, they've gone and now they're in the ways of the world. 
Hey, how about going and saying, brother, sister, I can't agree with what you're doing, but I want you to know I love you, I'm praying for you, and you draw up alongside and say, how can I help you? How can I help you? Not in a degrading way, but just saying, look, I, I, I would want somebody to come to me if I was in and having problems. Is there something we can do? I want you to know you're loved. And nothing you can say to me now, nothing you can do to me now will keep me from loving you. And I want you to know that I love you. And there needs to be more of that in the body of Christ. We leave that up to the paid staff. We leave that up to a couple of people. And it ought to be all of us involved, body life, trying to restore that fallen brother or sister in Christ. Do you know someone that's away from the, from the Lord? Uh, when have you tried to contact them? Or do you sit and say, yeah, they used to, or this is what they're doing, or boy, I can't stand that, and, and they're, they're the off-scouring of the earth. God help us in that. I'm so glad that our Savior didn't treat us that way. And I'm so glad even in my own personal life, when I get cold and things get dry, the Lord doesn't forsake me. He says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. And yet he comes to me time and time again and says, Mike, you need to get this right. Mike, you need to get that right. And then when I bow my rebellious spirit to him and I get things right, he restores me immediately. And he cleanses me. I'm no longer dirty. I'm no longer backslidden. I'm right with God. I'm in fellowship. I can have my prayers answered once again. It ought to be the example of each and every one of us. Now notice what it says here in verse 20. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner. That's the saved one. That's the brethren in verse 19. He says, let him know that he which converteth the sinner turns him back around. What privilege you and I have as we can be a tool in God's hands to draw up alongside someone and help restore them to fellowship. Let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. You say, what does that mean, save a soul from death? Is that talking about the, the fires of hell? No, I believe that that's talking about, talking about the restoration of a saved person because there is a sin unto death mentioned in the scriptures. Take your Bibles once again. I want you to see this so you know I'm just not talking out of my head here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we have the Lord's Supper passage. I'm not going to read the entire passage, but I want to begin here in chapter 11, verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation, judgment, damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause... Many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. The New Testament word for those who have gone on to heaven. That they, because they've taken of the Lord's Supper unworthily, God said, you know what? I put up with you enough. I put up with your disobedience enough. I've tried to interact. I've, I've allowed you to have the opportunity to get right with me. You've refused. I've had others try to help you in the church. You've refused. And so some are weak mentally unstable, some are sick, physically infirm, and we find some and many, the Bible says, sleep. Sometimes he has to just go and say, I'm taking you to glory. It doesn't mean that everyone that is uh, taken before the age of 70 is out of fellowship with God. Uh, God is the giver of life, he is the taker of life. But here is a warning that you and I need to take to heart as believers that if we're not careful, we can commit the sin unto death. Not talking about the unpardonable sin as we'll look at this evening. But what we're talking about here is when we in our obstinacy as blood-bought believers, if we refuse to get right, sometimes God says, you know what? I'm going to put you on the shelf and I'm not going to use you anymore. And then others, he says, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and take you to heaven. You're no good to me here. And so we need to understand that. Now take your Bibles and go to uh, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Hope you don't mind us using our Bibles. <laughs> 1 John chapter 5. Just two verses of scripture here. 
verses 16 and 17. It says these words, if any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. The fact of the matter is, we don't know, the Bible's not conclusive telling us what that particular sin is. But it, there is a sin unto death. There comes a time where God says, that is enough. And so it behooves us as believers to take the admonition of Scripture. That if we say we're Christians, we ought to live like Christians. And not only are we to take this admonition on ourselves, but we ought to also be involved in the harness, helping our brothers and sisters in Christ live a righteous and holy life because there's where the peace and joy of the Lord is. And when someone is restored, if you go back to our text passage of scripture, when someone is restored, it says these words, it says, the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. What does that mean? That means their sins are covered. They're remembered no more. They're not brought to, it's like David. Sure, we have the record of the sins he committed, but yet we have the testimony of God himself that David, by the will of God, served his own generation and fell on sleep. Thank God he is a forgiving God. And we as blood-bought sinners in right standing with God, looking forward to heaven, we ought to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation, the ministry of restoration, drawn up alongside of those and helping them get back into fellowship with God and helping them feel a part of the family of God because they are. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. Appreciate your attention today. I don't know how God has spoken to you. I know one thing, he spoke to me. I always say that before I preach a message here, God hits me in the study. Christian, where are you in regards to the sin in your own life? Are you like the prodigal? Or are you like the elder brother? Where are you? I trust you're not in any one of those. But if you are, oh, the admonition of the Father is, hey, get back into fellowship. The Father's right here. The Father's right here. Get back into fellowship. Christian, do you know someone who's not into fellowship? One who knows Jesus Christ is their personal Savior. But they're out of fellowship with God. When was the last time you dropped to your knees and you said, oh God, and call out their name and say, please intervene in that brother or sister's life? When was the last time you maybe picked up a telephone or you went digging around to find an address and said, you know what? I'm gonna go find them. You know, Jesus came looking for you why don't you go look for them? Why don't you say, brother, sister, I love you. And it's been too long. It's been too long. We want you back in fellowship. Hey, how can we help? How can we help? Restore such a one. In the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted.